Hi, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Mental Architecture, Building the Mind One Moment at a Time, based off of this book, written by yours truly, available exclusively for purchase on Amazon. So today I want to head into the sixth chapter of my book, which is titled No Decisions. No Decisions meaning that perhaps we as humans don't make our own decisions. Maybe they're made for us. The first section or the, the title of this um, section is going to be the power of the unconscious mind. So we often think about our conscious mind as being the thing that makes all our decisions. I know you've heard the old argument of free will versus not having free will. So what do we have control over? What don't we have control over? Are our thoughts predestined? Are they happening because of external extraneous forces? Or are they happening because of something inside of us we're making that decision ourselves? One thing I'll say is, who are you? Who am I? That's not that easy of a question to answer. Are you the sum of your conscious thoughts and actions or are you the sum of some of your unconscious thoughts and actions? So let me open up with a really nice quote. This is by Joel Kinnaman. He said, in philosophy, they talk a lot about humans being actual organic machines. And the idea of free will is something that we've made up. We actually don't have free will. We're acting according to our programming as organic mechanisms. Let's think about for a minute how you make your decisions. And what is even more interesting is how the decisions you make lead to more decisions. So let's say you're sitting on the couch watching TV and you're watching a show you really like and you get hungry. You're going to probably pause your TV show if that's an option. If you're streaming, it's definitely an option. And you're going to get up, go to the kitchen and get yourself a snack. Now, when you go to the kitchen, you got to figure out what you want to eat. You got to make a decision. Do you want something fatty and greasy or do you want something more healthy? Well, when we snack most of the time, we're going to gravitate towards something probably salty, sweet, um, you know, unless we're trying to be health conscious. And then we go for something like, you know, carrot sticks or celery or something like that. The decision you make about what to eat will then determine your next decision. So if, if we decide that we're going to eat something salty and greasy, let's say some really greasy potato chips, oh my God, it's going to taste so great in the moment. You're going to love it. But then when you're done eating that, you might not feel so good. You might feel dried out. And so now you're going to, you're going to feel thirsty. Your brain's going to tell you, we'll get some, something to drink. If you had eaten carrot sticks and celery, you might not have enjoyed them as much in the moment, but you probably wouldn't have gotten so thirsty. So the decision to eat junk food led you to another decision, another decision. I call this a decision tree. And I think our whole, our whole life is one giant decision tree. Now, so the decisions you make impact future decisions as well. And they can have profound influences on the kind of decisions you make. I mean, small decisions can lead to larger and larger decisions. A decision like where you want to go to college. You want to go stay at home, live with your parents and go to a local school? Or do you want to take a leap of faith and travel halfway across the country or across the world and start school there? That is a decision that will impact your decision tree in a huge way. It's almost like the butterfly effect where one thing you do you know, affects another and another and another. We're making these kind of decisions all the time. And so the question I have for you is, do you think that these decisions are happening because you want them to, because it's coming from your free will? or are you almost making decisions in a very indecisive, may not be the right word, but in an, an uncontrollable kind of way? That would be really scary, wouldn't it? That would imply some kind of determinism at work. See, I don't really believe and buy into the whole free will versus determinism argument. I don't think it has to be one way or the other. I think it could be both. You could have a combination of free will and determinism, but let's not talk about what I believe. Let's talk about what the research says. Professor Ezekiel Morella, consciousness is not only less purposeful and all-knowing than expected, but also contributes only one function, albeit an essential one, to a wide range of processes, much as how the internet plays the same critical role for a varied group of events. So Ezekiel's theory is actually known as passive frame theory. And passive frame theory is totally counterintuitive and maybe a little weird, but it makes a lot of sense. He basically says that the unconscious mind acts as a sort of data processor and determines everything that it wants you to do. 
And then the conscious mind is the ex executive function where those actions get carried out. So it almost sounds kind of Frankenstein-ish, but basically you're, you're in some ways not entirely in control of your decisions. If you consider your conscious mind to be the center of control. And so I guess this gets into the question of who are you? Are you your unconscious mind? Or are you only your conscious mind? I mean, both are still you, right? We don't think of ourselves as these like two different people, but in reality, we are actually fractured into quite a few different people because sometimes you do things without really intending to do them. You go, oh man, I wish I hadn't done that. I don't know why I did that. And so the unconscious mind can kind of push you into action. And the unconscious mind can also cause you to have certain kinds of feelings. Like if you've ever felt, uh, had a gut feeling, a lot of us, swear by acting on our guts and haven't you noticed when you act on your gut that you're usually right i know i have you people intuitively trust their gut feeling because your brain is telling you i know what's going on you didn't consciously figure out what was going on in fact if you sat there overthinking it too much you might even override your gut feeling and how many times have you regretted regretted going against your gut most of the time right there's a couple instances where you could probably think of Going, you went against your gut, it worked out for you, great. But usually our gut is right. And so um, another psychological researcher actually found that the gut feeling is processed in a part of the brain called the insula, and which, which is the insular cortex. And that actually is an unconsciously processed signal that is sent to you. So really fascinating how unconscious mind can play such a large role in the conscious experience of a decision. So what, what passive frame theory suggests is that your conscious decisions are just brief little blips of many, many minutes, possibly hours of unconscious processing. And talk about feeling things in your gut. Like, it turns out that if you really study our evolutionary history, that before we had a brain up here, before we evolved into this, you know, thinking, feeling human, our brain was down here in our gut, in our, in our stomach. And there are actually neurons in our stomach. And so the, the, you know, the gut feeling idea basically suggests that in our brains are signals going off that are connecting with the brain up here is connecting with the brain down here. And so you could argue that you have two major nerve centers, two major brains, and that's why you actually can think with your gut. And in passive frame theory, they consider the conscious mind to be an extension of the unconscious mind. In fact, it, it's not really like, it's almost like why even distinguish them as two things? Again, if you want to focus on yourself as one person, it's not like you have two people, unconscious mind and conscious mind going against each other. The conscious mind is where we experience the actions that the unconscious mind is calling out. The, the unconscious mind is sort of like the organizer and it executes it through that conscious function. And you can think of your gut feeling as a similar kind of thing. It's your unconscious mind at work and causing you to act a certain way. Gut feelings are great and they can be really great in survival situations, but that's not all there is to cognition. We also have to respect the fact that we do sit there sometimes and ponder consciously over things. Like for instance, if you're playing a game of chess, you probably don't want to go off of gut instinct for the entire game. Your gut definitely could help you if you have a lot of experience playing chess, but sometimes it's best to sit down and think through systematically what you want to do. But even in doing that action, your unconscious mind is still very busily at work. I have a question for you. I want you to think about this. A lot of times people say, well, if I have free will, then I have control over all my thoughts. I think a thought because I wanted to think it. I did something because I wanted to do that. If, we, if the world is truly fatalistic or determined, deterministic, then you have no control over your thoughts and, and no control over your actions. You're just acting according to whatever the higher plan is. Whatever your unconscious mind decides, that's what you do. And that can be very depressing, it make you feel kind of like, what's the point? But I challenge the ancient philosophy, and I feel like it's a lot of modern philosophy, this binary way of thinking that things have to be either free will or fatalistic, like I said earlier. I don't think it has to be that way. So in my book, I wrote a little sentence that I'd like you to think about. I basically said, do you need to be completely aware of the decisions being made by your brain to feel a sense of control over them? or a sense of ownership I wrote over them. So if you make decisions unconsciously, can you still take a sense of ownership in them? I mean, you still made those decisions, right? They came from your brain. It's not like your brain made them and is trying to screw you over. 
and sell you on something you don't need. Your brain was acting in your best interest. You feel like we have a blend of free will and a blend of determinism. The conscious experience allows us to feel like we have some sense of control. The unconscious mind, you're just not aware of. And I guess there's that, well, if I'm not aware of it, am I really making that decision? I would argue you still are. You still are making that decision. You are just, when you're conscious, you're not using all the parts of your brain at once. There are things that go on while you're sleeping. There are things that go on while you're daydreaming, while you're doing other things. Parts of your brain that you're not aware of are working hard. And this is, you know, I mean, thank God too, right? There's semi-autonomous functions like breathing, um, swallowing, uh, you know, I, all kinds of things we just do, we're blinking our eyes. We do very reflexively and we don't think about these things. They happen whether we're thinking about them or not, but we have some degree of control over them. You can change your breathing patterns. I mean, in meditation, you have to do that and exercise to pay attention to your breathing. So that's where that executive function comes in. Maybe I need to slow it down. Maybe I need to speed it up, but your unconscious mind is working right along there with you, with your conscious mind. So maybe one of the greatest mistakes in, in psychology and philosophy was to separate the mind into conscious and unconscious. Maybe we should just think of it as one mind all integrated together. And then you absolutely have free will. You absolutely have the freedom to make your own choices because you trust in your gut, you trust in your mind that it will lead you in the right directions, except when things go wrong. Well, then you don't want to. Yeah. <laughs> but hey, let's be, let's be optimistic about it. All right. Another thing I want you to think about is acting versus reacting. So as you go through your, your day, you feel like you're making these decisions, but are you? Are you making decisions or are you just reacting to things that are happening to you? Are you reacting to the people that you're around? I mean, I want you to do a little thought experiment. And if you watched my last video um, on the power of individuality, this is a very similar thought experiment. And that video I talked about, imagine you grew up in a different country with a different set of, with, with the same set of parents. How would you have turned out differently? And I think we can all agree very, you would have turned out very, very differently because your whole entire life and circumstances would have been completely overturned and changed. So let me ask you this. Let's not, let's not extrapolate to, you know, it's not, let's not go hyperbolic here and send you to a different country, but let's say that instead of interacting with the people you interacted with today, you instead went to a random conference on kayaking downtown and you interacted with, you know, 60 people you've never met before. Do you think that interacting with those 60 people, you would have made different decisions? Well, just the fact that you're at a conference on something that you might or may not be familiar with is going to cause you to have to think about different things. And you're going to have to react to different things in the conversations that come up in, in the car ride over there, different things that you would have never had to deal with while you were maybe at home with your family. So I would argue that we're actually not acting very often. We're always reacting, but there's a lot of power in reacting and knowing how to react. Acting and reacting. You, you, you have a situation, you need to decide what to do. So the situation comes into your unconscious mind or just your mind, you process it, and then you make your own action. And then sometimes you have to react to your own action. Like maybe your action was at this conference to start talking about basketball because you didn't know much about kayaking. And now the person you're talking to is a complete expert on, on basketball. They're, they're a huge fan. And they start talking to you about stuff that's a little bit over your head. Maybe you need to steer the conversation away. You're reacting to that and acting again. They're reacting to you. Is reacting an act of free will? I believe that it is because you can choose how you want to react to something. You have a set of values. You have a moral compass. You have certain things that you're interested in that can choose how you respond. But, you know, another example is just we react all the time. Let's say that you're trying to sleep at night, but there's a siren blaring outside. If that siren weren't blaring outside, you probably would sleep fine. But with the siren blaring, it wakes you up. It starts to irritate you. You know, if it's really loud and obnoxious, you're gonna have a hard time ignoring that. You might react by getting up, going outside, checking it out, seeing what it is. You've interrupted your sleep. It's interrupted your sleep too. So there's, there's a really, Fine line between reacting and acting. I believe all actions are reactions to other actions. And just another thing about acting and reacting is the types of decisions we make are a direct product of our environment. Now, before the agricultural revolution, getting food was a major ordeal. You couldn't just go to the grocery store and pick up something to eat. You couldn't just run through a fast food drive through and pick up something to eat. When we're living in times of abundance, which we truly are right now, even, even though this is a terrible time in our history, 
and there's a lot of terrible things going on right now. Overall, we are still very blessed. You know, finding food is not difficult compared to how it was back then. Look, and I'm not, I'm not trying to minimize um, experiences for those of you who have hardships. I think all of us have hardships and, and they're very real, but I'm just talking about comparing a century, the 21st century to like the 18th or 17th century. Now, if you strip away the abundance that we have, you take away the homes, you take away the cars, you take away the agriculture, you take all of that away and we're left to fend for ourselves, guess what kind of decisions we start making? We naturally evolve back to our primitive selves, to our hunting and gathering selves, and we become increasingly self-centered and we become increasingly brutal and we will do whatever it takes to survive. And this has been demonstrated through tons of experiments that when people are basically stripped away of all their abundances, they get into survival mode. That's what we call it. We call it survival mode. And I mean, you see, you know, this, we look at animals around us who don't have all this abundance, animals in the wild, and they're in survival mode. And for much of our human history, we were in that mode. And that's all we were in. We acted a lot more like the animals around us than we do like, you know, we would like modern human beings. So, the fact that we can make decisions about what book to write next and what trip to take next and where we want to work next, that is so abundant. That is so amazing that we've gotten to this point as a species that we can do these kind of things that we forget about our roots, but take away all that abundance, throw us into, throw us into uh, a wasteland and give us very little resources and we have to fight and compete over. Man, our primitive sides, they come out. And it's kind of like with animals, like if you've, if you've had a cat and you feed that cat really well, um, you'll notice the cat starts playing, starts, you know, it'll be really friendly with you jumping around and everything. But a cat who has to hunt for their food, they're not going to spend much time playing when they're hungry. They're not going to play. And humans are the same way. So our decisions that we make are definitely, you know, circumstantial. They're circumstantial to the environment we're in. And if you were to change that environment, you would make different kinds of decisions. So I would say, trust your gut. I trust my gut, but you know, sometimes it's good to think through things too. What I wanna get into in the next section is, are some of the decisions we make influenced by our ancestors? So the kinds of things that they thought about and that they did, does that make its way down into our DNA? And do we make decisions based off of the decisions that our ancestors made? This is an idea called genetic memories. So memories that are somehow encoded in our genes, and so you'll have to wait for the next video to find out about that, or you can just pick up my book and read about it if you want. I want to thank you so much for coming and watching another one of my mental architecture videos. These have been a lot of fun to make, and I look forward to seeing you guys again next week. Please make sure to like, comment, subscribe, and ring the bell, and you'll be notified of my future videos. Be safe, taking good care of yourselves and your families. All right, everybody. Bye.